Uh, let's get started. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Arvind Suresh. I'm one of the co-founders of the uh, Appalachian Science Communicators. Uh, we're a regional science communicators uh, ba group based in Pittsburgh, for those of you who are here joining us for the first time. Um, and we are um, connected to the National Association of Science Writers. Um, and pretty much everybody who's in AppSycon is probably a member of the National Association of Science Writers. And um, this group has been in existence for a little over a year at this point. Um, and thanks to COVID, we actually got started with this virtual um, AppSycom conversation series, which has turned out to be really successful. And we've had some very interesting guests and uh, lots of participants from around the country, um, to be honest. And speaking of interesting guests, um, today we have uh, Dr. Curtis Mariana Professor um, I'm going to pass this off to my colleague, Ken Kiakia, who is going to introduce Curtis and um, kick things off today. And um, if you want to know more about our group, you could visit appsycom.org. Uh, we're on Facebook primarily um, and uh, get connected to us. If you want to join us, let us know and we'll have lots more to come. So Ken, take it away. I uh, first got to write about Curtis's work a number of years back when I uh, wrote about his use of Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center's machines to simulate the ancient climate in South Africa as part of this really big project using field experiments, uh, uh, lab work, and of course computation to figure out how the origins of human behavior happen. We all have our pet theories on what makes humans special. Uh, with this kind of understanding that that we are obviously different, but it's so hard to nail it down so that it actually holds up. Um, you know, corvids can improvise tools. Bees may or may not be able to do simple math. Uh, whales can communicate. But the question, of course, is, you know, did some of the, which change happened first, which changes drove each other? And Curtis has taken all of, all of this information and, and a lot of data to try to come up with a, a hypothesis that actually explains how it came about. Uh, and I'm real interested to hear about that and his work with Scientific American to, to popularize this message to, to, to lay, lay audience. So Curtis, take it away. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here to speak to you. I actually uh, went to university. My, my undergraduate was at Penn State, uh, used to make regular trips to Pittsburgh, which I know many of you are based there or have recently. And I actually grew up right next to the Appalachian Trail. Um, you guys, some of you might have driven through Stroudsburg and Delaware Water Gap. Well, that's, that's where I grew up. So I'm originally from the region. And uh, at, if you've read my work, you know I'm interested in coastal adaptations and the importance of the ocean for human evolution. And uh, I got interested in the ocean because my mother said uh, we needed to have a family vacation and she basically threw a dart at a map and it hit coastal Maine. So we go there every, every summer. And that's, that's where I, I learned about the ocean and its rhythms. And that had a, it gave me a personal connection to the sea, which has flown in, into my work, which you'll hear a little bit about uh, today. So thanks for inviting me. I just want to do a, a, a possible apology. I have a one-year-old Labrador retriever and uh, he barks like crazy if somebody knocks on the door. I just ran him hard out in the backyard in the pool to wear him out. He's sound asleep at my feet, but if he barks, um, that, that's why. So I'm going to share my screen and um, we'll, get, we'll get started. Okay, thumbs up on, uh, you can see it? Yeah, okay, okay. So um, yeah, the, the organizers asked me to do two things really, is, is talk about the science and give you an overview of the work that we've done. Uh, and, I, and that really is a we, I have a really big team, maybe 40, 50 people at any one time who are involved in it. Um, but also to talk a little bit about the production of those two Scientific American papers, and I'm kind of working on a third uh, right now um, on some newer research that my team has been doing on the 
Mount Toba super volcanic eruption that occurred 74,000 years ago. And we, we've published a paper in Nature a couple of years ago on that. Um, I'm not going to talk about that that today, but uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about these these other two uh, papers um, in the context of of the science. So what I thought I'd do is um, I'll give you this is the talk structure. I'll give you a little background on the state of the art of modern human origins, which is um, a field that's constantly changing. You know, there's always new material. There's just a new paper out a couple days ago in Nature. Got a lot of press, science media press. Um, I'm going to talk about the coastal glacial refuge hypothesis, which is the hypothesis I developed. And um, that was the, the subject of the 2010 Scientific American paper. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the great human diaspora and what we could call the hyperprosociality hypothesis, which is the second hypothesis I developed. And that was the topic of the 2015 Scientific American uh, paper. And then I'll end with a few comments about um, what motivated me to write the two Scientific American papers and how I went about doing it, kind of the process that I took. And I, I, I've never, I didn't have a lot of experience doing science media writing. I had a lot of experience doing science media speaking. So I do a lot of talks um, and I drew on that, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about how I approached the, the writing um, aspect. So in this graph, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quick overview of modern human origins in a simplified manner. I've been using this slide for about a decade, and I just keep updating it as, as we go along. And it, of course, is a simplification of, of what we know. Now, on the bottom here, where I'm indicating with the, uh, my mouse, I have a long proxy record for global climate, which is the delta deuterium record from the Epica ice core. And when that uh, line is down here in the bottom, we're in a cold glacial phase. And when we're up here in that uh, reddish color, we're in a warm interglacial phase. And there's a pretty simple message there. And the, the message is, is that the majority of the last 800,000 years of human evolution uh, the world has been in a glacial phase, and we're, of course, in an interglacial phase right now. So that means um, the world that humans evolved in was wildly different than what it is today from a climatic and environmental context. And this is why uh, a lot of people who do what I do, uh, human origins, paleoanthropology work, also do quite a bit of paleoclimate work and paleoenvironmental work. And you heard a little bit about the simulation work that we, we did with the, the supercomputer center. And then up above, um, I'm going to have the what we some information on what we know about modern human origins. And you can see I split it into two lineages, the Eurasian archaic lineage and the African archaic lineage. And they share a last common ancestor somewhere about 700 or 800,000 years ago. And what that basically means is, is that at one point, there was quite a bit of gene flow between um, pre-moderns in Africa and Eurasia. And then at some point they started to uh, split and I'll talk a little bit about that. And on this graph, when um, a line ends in a circle, that means it ends in extinction. So that lineage is, is gone now. Now we know that from the fossil record but also from the genetic record that between about 800,000 and 400,000 years ago, there was gene flow between these two lineages. And that's probably because you know, humans and other animals and so on could move in and out of Africa, uh, perhaps not easily, but they could get in and out and that, that created that gene flow. And then right around 400,000 years ago, that gene flow was cut. And um, in my opinion, it probably was cut because of the formation of the Sahara Desert. So the Sahara Desert, which in fact, continues right on through to the Arabian Peninsula, right? You have that big band of desert um, across Northern Africa into Arabia. But you can think of that as a cork uh, in the bottle that is Africa. And that cork is sometimes firmly in the opening of the bottle. And sometimes it's pulled out and things and animals and people can get out of Africa and cross through the Levant, the Middle East, and, and out. 
But um, when the world is in a glacial phase, that cork is in there. <laughs> and that's because the Sahara is there, the Sinai Desert is there, the Negev Desert is there. And hunter-gatherers, and of course, we're, this is at a time when we're in hunting and gathering economies, there's no food production, can't make it through pure deserts. They don't have the technology to do that. So that is a, that is a biogeographic barrier to gene flow and, and human movement. And then if you've been following the science media, you know that this interesting, mysterious lineage called the Denisovans originated sometime around 400, 350,000 years ago, and they end in extinction. And then the lineage we know a, a lot about, Neanderthals, in fact, we have a good 200 plus individuals represented in the fossil record, some of them by complete skeletons. We know a lot about Neanderthals. They originate oh, around 300, 350,000 years ago. Um, and that, that lineage ends in extinction. And Denisovans, as far as we know, were mostly toward Eastern Eurasia and Neanderthals were mostly toward Western Eurasia, but they met in the middle. And we know that Neanderthals and Denisovans hybridized. So we actually have an individual fossil that is known to be a first generation hybrid of a Neanderthal parent and a Denisovan parent. Pretty spectacular find. Um, and then the modern human lineage, and uh, notice that it ends in an arrow. That's because, of course, we're still here, hopefully for uh, a good amount of time, though we may screw that up, you never know. <laughs> um, the, uh, the modern human lineage appears sometime around 200,000 years ago. And there's some debate now over whether it would be more toward 150,000 years ago or more toward 300,000 years ago. There is a, a genetic study published a couple of years ago that suggested an earlier date back to 300,000. But the, the majority of the genetic estimates are around 200 to 150,000 years ago. But hopefully we will resolve that uh, sometime soon. And that's pretty concordant with the fossil record. So the fossil record and the genetic record are pretty concordant on that. Um, and then, uh, you know, sometime around 70,000 years ago, I'm gonna use that as a consensus date, 70,000, though it might be a little earlier, might be a little later. Um, a small founder population of uh, Africans leaves Africa and heads off into Eurasia. And all Eurasians are descended from that small founder population, okay? So that now creates two lineages, two modern human lineages, the African lineage and the Eurasian lineage that are present on the planet, okay? And um, when that Eurasian lineage leaves Africa, it an immediately encounters Neanderthals because Neanderthals are in the Middle East and there are a series of hybridization events. Not a lot, a couple. It's unclear exactly how many there are, but again, not many, many. There's a few hybridization events. And uh, some of the offspring of those hybrids survive and are part of the modern human groups that are present, uh, such that um, all Eurasians have a small component of Neanderthal DNA in their genome, 2 to 4%, 4%, somewhere around that. And we're starting to learn what those Neanderthal genes do. And the fact that they're there indicates that they added some kind of benefit because they must have been under positive selection to be retained like that. And then of course, um, that founder population gives rise to this huge proliferation of lineages and ethno-linguistic groups, which essentially become the same at this point. Um, spreading throughout Eurasia and so on. And we know that people who are primarily now found in Aust the indigenous people of Australia and Papua New Guinea encountered Denisovans. And there was some hybridization with the Denisovans such that those folk have Denisovan DNA in their genomes. So uh, many of these, all of these prior hominin taxa that were here relatively recently are now extinct, but we have bits and pieces of their genomes 
in the genome of modern humans. And then after uh, the Eurasians left Africa, there is a hybridization event between Africans and an archaic African lineage that was living. Uh, but of course, that lineage is, is now extinct. And that, that's an, actually an interesting story. I don't have time to get into it. Um, so there's all these, you know, if you were an alien and you visited Earth 40,000, 45,000 years ago, you would see all these lineages of, of near modern humans and modern humans, and they're all kind of doing the same thing at that point. And then if you came back 20,000 years ago, there would be one left and it would be spread all over the planet. And of course, if you came back today, that one that was left is coming out into space. And if I was the alien, I probably would turn my phasers up to 11 and I'd smoke that planet. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Okay, now all modern humans have narrow genetic diversity relative to other species. And this is an interesting pattern and suggests that that origin population uh, was small. Though we do have a lot of debate over how small uh, it is um, and what caused that small character. So if we zoom in on that last 450,000 years ago, um, and this is that glacial interglacial record that I just showed you, right? Uh, we use the term marine isotope stage for these big shifts. So marine isotope stage six is this long cold glacial that goes from about 200,000 years ago to um, 130,000 years ago. And then there's another glacial phase back here, 350 to 250. And if you remember, I, I argued that the majority of genetic estimates put the origin of our species in marine isotope stage six, this glacial phase, but we do have one estimate that puts it back into marine isotope stage eight, back in, in here. So we really need to resolve that because that's a crucial piece of information. And I hope that, you know, in the next few years, we will have an, an, an answer for that. Okay, so um, here's a simplified projection of what Africa would look like in terms of the vegetation regime during a glacial. Uh, the continent is gonna be cold and dry. So the Sahara Desert is, pro is about twice as big as it is today. So the Sahara is even a tougher cork in the bottle of Africa than during a glacial phase than it is um, today. There would be a huge arid zone where the Namib Desert is today in the Kalahari, significantly expanded. And the Central African rainforest uh, would not be a rainforest. There would only be tiny pockets of rainforest represented. And it's probably mostly a dry woodland to grassland um, ecosystem. So what I've argued, and other people have argued this as well, is, is that during these glacial phases, you have some regions that are inhabitable to hunter-gatherers, but the vast majority of Africa is not habitable, right? Just the Sahara and the Namib and Kalahari Desert alone are probably 50% of the continent. So 50% of the continent cannot be inhabited. And different zones of habitability have barriers between them. So now you have isolated populations and isolated populations, small isolated populations are ones that go extinct easily, but also have very high rates of evolution. And um, so maybe anywhere between five to seven isolated populations. And I argued that it was the Southern African population that was the one that gives rise to modern humans. Now, why the South African coast? I've published um, two scientific articles originally that uh, made the argument for this. And there are now actually 10 scientific articles that build on that original argument. But these are the two origin papers that did it. And, um, and what I argued is basically an ecological potentiality argument. The argument is, is that this region provides a uniquely rich and stable source of food. And that richness and stability provided a refuge during harsh glacial phases. And um, I decided to write a public version of that hypothesis. And that was the first 
Scientific American paper uh, that I, I published. And, and that, hap that ended up being a very popular article. It's been republished several times now by Scientific American in their, their compendium volumes. So what, why is it? I'm not gonna go too much into the details, um, but just a couple of important points. This is a, a, gra a, a map of the world's floral kingdom. So the, the kingdom classification is the biggest classification, most general inclusive classification. You can see um, all of Africa is the paleotropics, but notice straight away that one of the kingdoms is this little tiny sliver of land in the southernmost tip of, of Africa. And in fact, when the Dutch first got there and Dutch uh, naturalists got there, they right away recognized that the vegetation was like nothing they've ever seen before. Um, and what we know now, and it's been studied to death because of its uniqueness, is that for its area and for its rainfall, it has the highest diversity of any region um, in the world. And it has a super high endemism rate. So endemism, 64% uh, of the plants are endemic to that region. So in other words, 64% of the plant species, which there's about 13,000 documented now, are only found there. That's it. You might have them in your gardens if you, you know, live in Arizona, um, but they're only they're there only because um, they've been taken there as as immigrants. And one of the the plants that's super abundant there are plants that have below ground storage organs. So on this graph, which I've redrawn from a famous paper, um, I've put area on the x axis. And that's because normally species diversity goes up with area. And I've put geophyte plant species diversity on this axis. And geophytes are plants with below ground tuberous parts. And the reason those are important is hunter gatherers love them. They're filled with starch. So these are like little corms, potatoes, carrot, that kind of plant food. And on this line, I've put other Mediterranean Machia ecosystems. And Mediterranean ecosystems are ecosystems that receive their um, rain in the winter. And it's in winter rainfall regimes that these below ground tuberous plants are most abundant. Um, and you can see the other Mediterranean ecosystems, the diversity of plants, of underground storage organ plants goes up with area. That's how it should be. And in fact, that relationship is a law in ecology. But look at the Cape. It demolishes that law, right? It's so bizarre. There are 2,400 species of below ground tuberous plants in the Cape, and it should be down here based on this mathematical function. So that gives you an idea of how abundant they are. So I argued that those plants, which are adapted to dry environments, right? So they would be thriving during glacial phases. We're still there during glacial phases for hunters and gatherers to use. The other leg of the argument is that um, you have an extremely rich coastline off the coast of South Africa. And that rich coastline is caused by the collision of a warm tropical current, the Agullis current. It's called the Madagascar current further north. The Agullis current, as it comes down, that's the reddish water. It collides with the Benguela upwelling, which is a cold, um, upwelling. And when you have this collision of hot and cold water, and you, you normally get really rich eco, oceanic ecosystems. And that certainly is the case um, in South Africa. So the intertidal zone in South Africa is ridiculously rich. And again, um, the oceanic productivity would not be depressed by glacial phases. In fact, oceanic productivity goes up as oceanic waters get colder, where terrestrial productivity goes down during glacial phases. It's just the opposite relationship. So the argument is, is that the intertidal zone plus the rich collectible plant foods created a refuge during glacier, glacials for our species at its origin point. And that's the story that I told um, in that Scientific American paper. Now, 
if you follow the, you know, if you're still remembering what I was saying about my summary of the modern human origins, um, you will not, you remember that at 70,000 years ago, a founder population of Africans, right? These are, these are modern humans, African people, leaves Africa. And by founder population, I mean a small population, a couple hundred people. And in my opinion, the most parsimonious hypothesis is, is that this was one ethno-linguistic group that left Africa, one. And they leave Africa almost certainly through the Sinai and the Gev, sometime between 80 and 60,000 years ago. I'm going to use 70 as, as the sweet spot date. And they make it all the way to Australia by 65,000 years ago. I mean, that's like they were racing <laughs> to get there. And it, it's an incredible thing because when they got to the shores of Southeast Asia, they couldn't see Australia. But for some reason, those people built ocean worthy boats, put their families on them and sailed off into the ocean and they hit Australia. And that was also a very small group of people. And in their way were the Denisovans. And the Denisovans go extinct after encountering modern humans and interbreeding with them. And when they get to Australia, there's a massive megafaunal extinction that takes place. Now, there's a lot of debate over whether humans created it or not, but in my opinion, they had to have been involved in, in some way. They make it to Western Europe by 45,000 years ago, and by 40,000 years ago, Neanderthals um, are extinct. Now, um, I want to point out that we used to, just recently, we used to think they got to Australia by 45,000 years ago. But I want to point out that the maximum date you can get with radiocarbon is about 45,000. Between 38,000 and 45,000, radiocarbon gets very dicey. And in my opinion, these dates are glass ceilings produced by method. And I think that this date of the arrival of modern humans in Europe is going to go back as we start to apply more techniques that can reach further back into the past. Modern humans make it above the Arctic Circle uh, by 45,000 years ago. Again, we keep hitting that radiocarbon uh, glass ceiling. I think it is going to sh show up to be earlier. Um, they get stuck in this area, Beringia, which at that time has a land mass for 20, 25,000, maybe 30,000 years. And then they make it into North America at least by 14,000 years ago, probably earlier. They get to the southernmost tip of South America almost immediately, right, 13,000 years ago. And there's another massive megafaunal extinction that takes place. So the story of the great human diaspora happens fast with pulses of modern humans out of Africa, plunging into environments, massive extinction events occurring, near modern humans going extinct all along the trail. Uh, that's, a, in my opinion, a bloody trail. And then you end up with modern humans all over the planet, and they very quickly begin to shape that planet to their own needs. And that's, I was told that, you know, I developed a hypothesis for how and why this happened in these two scientific papers. And that was the story I told in the second Scientific American paper. And what I argued is, is that we conquered the planet due to the evolution of a unique set of cooperative behaviors. And these cooperative behaviors evolved in a coastal adaptation. And now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what I mean by that and, and why. Now, humans have a unique combination of three traits. We have an advanced cognition. We hear a lot of people talk about that in human evolution. We, have, we also have a very special and unique psychology of social learning. I'm not gonna talk much about that, but it's important. But we're also extremely cooperative. We cooperate with uh, non-kin at very high levels. And that's unique in the animal kingdom. And I've called that this hyper-pro-social proclivity. 
And when you put those three things together, you create the capacity for the modern human cumulative culture adaptation. That's our primary adaptation. All other animals adapt to their environments primarily through anatomy and evolved behavioral characteristics. But our adaptation is culture. And it's these three characteristics of humans that make culture possible. We don't have these. We can't have the modern human cultural adaptation as we see it uh, today. And I've argued, and many other people have argued, is that these three capacities are embedded in the genome. They're evolved. So they're subject to the rules of natural selection. So let me just quickly talk about how we got to be extremely cooperative. So here's an example of why this is important. This is a, a kind of a model of chimp sociality. Chimps have a single level society with no hyper pro sociality. They don't cooperate at really high levels with non-kin. So chimps are broken up into troops, small groups. And at the boundaries of those troops, there's conflict. And you can might remember the you know, discovery of that conflict by Jane Goodall long ago. Um, every chimp group is in warfare with every other chimp group. But modern human hunter-gatherers have multi-level sociality, which is supported by this emotion, emotional proclivity for hyper-prosociality. So you have multiple human groups like chimps, but we exchange mates between them. And that creates allies and kin in other groups. And in anthropology, we call that reciprocal exogamy, reciprocal outgroup marriage. And that's the glue upon which ethno-linguistic groups are formed. Um, and Bernard Chappé has a wonderful book that outlines uh, this important adaptation. Now, um, ethno-linguistic groups and hunter-gatherer societies, for the most part, have rules of marriage where you marry within the ethnolinguistic group, but not outside the ethnolinguistic group. And that's why ethnolinguistic groups and hunter gatherer societies are, for the most part, closed breeding populations. So here's the, the structure of multi scale modern human society. We have small groups, what we call bands, but you could call them troops if you wanted to. They are tied together through outgroup marriage and they form ethno-linguistic groups. And those ethno-linguistic groups are often in conflict with each other. But the important thing for my hypothesis is, if you take a single level society and you put it in conflict with a multi-level society, there's only one result. And that is the multi-level society replaces the single level society because multi-level societies can field more warriors in a conflict than single level societies. A single level society can only field the, mem the members of its group, maybe 10. A multi-level society, a tribal society like humans have, can put 70, 100 warriors into the field for battle. And what I've argued is, the hypothesis I've argued is, is that hyperprosociality and therefore the framework for multi-scale society evolved uniquely and the modern human lineage therefore post-dating the separation from Neanderthals 400,000 years ago. And that's what gave us the ability to replace Neanderthals when we left uh, Africa. So to wrap up the scientific part of my presentation, I'm just gonna ask, how do we evolve hyperprosociality? If it only evolved once, and all the animal groups in the planet, how do we evolve it? Well, I drew on a theory developed by Sam Bowles in a book, wonderful book, called A Cooperative Species in a paper in science, which I just call the warfare hypothesis. And he argues that among cultural groups, if you get between group competition and intergroup conflict, what you will find is groups that have individuals who tend to cooperate 
at high levels with non-kin, they will expand at the expense of groups that have low levels of cooperation. And that will result in the spread of hyper-prosocial groups. And if you get into his work, he does quite a bit of mathematical modeling and computer simulation to show that. So where I come into this theory is I address the issue of how do we get between group competition? And what I argued is, and I drew on the theory of economic defendability, which is a very well-known theory in behavioral ecology, which is a subcomponent of evolutionary ecology, is, is that, and if you project resource predictability on this axis and resource density on this axis, you will find that you will only get territorial behaviors, in other words, warfare behaviors, when resource predictability is high and resource density is also high. And in Africa, terrestrial African resources tend to have low predictability and low density. And the only resources that are very predictable and very dense are aquatic resources. So when humans evolved the cognitive complexity to figure out how to use coastal resources, and they entered the coastal adaptation niche that triggered high levels of warfare and territoriality that set up the selection regime for cooperative behaviors between non-kin and then resulted in the spread of hyper-prosocial proclivities um, through the population. So my hypothesis is essentially this. 200,000 years ago, a complex cognition and the origin of the modern human lineage evolved. That complex cognition allowed a shift to dense and predictable resources. That triggered elevated levels of territoriality and conflict, which sets up the selection regime for hyper-prosocial, psychological, and emotional proclivities. All of that happening around 150,000 years ago, that then results in the formation of multi-scale society and bands linked through ethnolinguistic groups. And then when humans, modern humans, develop uh, complex projectile technology linked to this ethnolinguistic group structure, that triggered the great human diaspora. It gave modern humans the ability to move out of Africa and outcompete all these other hominids on their home turf. So after developing that hypothesis, um, I decided to go public with it. And uh, that's the two Scientific American papers that you see here. And this is actually my favorite um, illustration. It was developed by a wonderful uh, team at Scientific American and actually the this individual is based on a photograph of a Khoisan person. Um, <clears throat> that's our oldest lineage in the world. It's the book, you might know them as the Bushman lineage. Um, and then we decided to put at, an atlatl, which is a spear thrower and um, complex projectile weapons in his hand. Uh, and a final touch was a map of the world with arrows as his war tattoos. And when um, I decided to write, start writing for the public, uh, I, I had a couple of goals and a couple of principles that I started with. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a creative writer. And I took a lot of classes in creative writing. I read hundreds and hundreds of books as a kid. Um, so I had that going for me. And in my opinion, human evolution has always been a, a really exciting story of struggle, of loss and triumph. And I thought that that was the way to communicate it to the public without, uh, you know, overemphasizing those aspects, without over dramatizing. The other thing is, is after you know, 30 some years of writing science, uh, I had divorced myself from the process of writing creatively. So I had to figure out how to get my mind out of technical writing. 
because um, technical writing is kind of machine language and uh, that doesn't work for the general public. Um, and part of that was uh, separating myself physically from the office. I didn't write anything in the office. I actually wrote both of my articles in coastal Maine while I was on vacation. And that put me in a very different psychology for writing than what I normally am when I'm sitting um, in my office. And um, I wanted to do some storytelling in the writing of this material. Uh, and that's because in my opinion, and in fact, one of my great wonderful colleagues, Polly Wiesner, uh, who is a famous ethnographer of the Bushmen, just wrote a paper uh, in uh, PNAS where she talked about how when humans evolved the capacity to make fire and sit around a fire, a hearth, that really was a game changing moment because it extended the life into the night. And it gave people a place to sit around and tell stories and, and process complex information. So to me, uh, storytelling is part of human evolution. And um, so I wanted to have a storytelling argument to, the, to my work. Uh, I wanted to create narrative momentum in both of those stories. I hope I did that. And narrative momentum that leads to triumph. So the triumph in the first paper is the survival of our species in the face of a, of a climate crisis, something I thought was relevant to things that we're facing today. Um, if you think about it, back in 2010, the whole Al Gore thing was, was still uh, out there. Um, and then the triumph in the second paper is the conquering of the planet. Whether or not we can consider that a good thing or a bad thing, we can argue about that. And then. Um, the other thing is I wanted to embed short dramatic stories and images in the writing uh, that would stimulate an emotional reaction that leaves an imprint. So if you go through those stories, you'll see little moments where there's uh, blood and death and violence and um, all of that kind of thing, which uh, shakes people and leaves um, an emotional imprint that keeps bringing them back to the story, right? Uh, those are the things that you always remember after you've read a, a, a good story. And finally, uh, I could have had all of those things and it would have been absolutely worthless without a great editor. And uh, I just wanna thank Kate Wong at Scientific American who just did a fabulous job of helping me find my voice when I wrote those papers. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I see I came in right at about 45 minutes, so that's okay. Uh, lots of thanks to my team in South Africa, the great teams of students who've helped me, the Mazel Bay community, uh, South African authorities, National Science Foundation, Hyde Foundation, Templeton, all the funders who have funded our work, and of course, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and the Exceed initiative. So I'm happy to take questions uh, at this point. Yeah, so so let's let's field some questions. Uh, I prepared a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to hog uh, the, the the talk with them, but I did want to fit in one before I opened it up to the to the community. Um, that that one slide is really evocative. Was the one showing the difference between the chimpanzee groups versus the human groups? And how that that interrelated group, the interrelated groups, exactly that one, um, gave the multi-level society uh, an inherent and profound advantage. Um, it made me think of two things, and so I'll cheat by doing a two-part question. If you did the single-level society slide using bonobos instead of chimps. Who, who may not have quite the same level of intergroup uh, um, uh, conflict, would it be different if how, so how? And, and the second part being, you know, there are a lot of species and, and pack and pride predators come to mind where the males are exported to other groups. Uh, and there, there, there is, and, and in fact, at, at some times of the year, groups may come together to hunt cooperatively in larger groups. It feels like this has to be different than the multi-level society, but 
exactly where does that difference come down to? Right. Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, obviously I'm, I'm kind of simplifying things, uh, you know, to, to, to set up uh, the, the significance of um, the uniqueness of human multi-level society. There is, you know, there's variation among animals, as, as Ken pointed out, um, but none of that variation even comes close to the complexity of multi-level society that modern humans have. Now with bonobos, that's a great question. So bonobo troops don't have the high level of uh, conflict at boundaries that, uh, that uh, common chimps have. In fact, um, there's some sex often that happens between uh, bonobo tr uh, troops as they come together. Um, there, you know, it, my reading of the literature, there's not a lot of cooperative behavior. When they come together, there's nervousness and there's quite a bit of uh, uh, display activity and communication that's going on, but then there is often some friendly relationships between them. So you can kind of think of, and this is of course the, the important thing about natural selection. Natural selection operates on variation. Right, so uh, that's your variation. Now I will say this though, imagine if bonobos came into contact with common chimps, a bonobo troop with a common chimp troop. Well, I would, my guess is, is you wouldn't have many bonobos left after a couple of years because uh, those organisms that uh, are not set up for defense, generally lose out to those that are. And of course, you know, we know from the chimp literature already that some chimp troops have been driven extinct by other chimp troops, right? There's some chimp troops have simply decimated others to the point there are no individuals left. So, uh, so that, you know, that would be my response. Bonobos are a good example of the variation. Um, there was a second part to your question that you, could you, yeah, that yeah. is the uh, the the how the exchange of 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 mates between okay, right. predator packs and and sometimes they do come together and and cooperate in larger groups. Right. So um, reciprocal exogamy, which I talked about a little bit earlier, very briefly, that's the outgroup marriage characteristic of all human societies. Right. I mean. Until recently, all human societies have had arranged marriage. We're lucky in that we get to choose our mates. Most people in, in the United States get to do that. But that wasn't the case, right? All marriage used to be arranged. Um, and it was arranged by your parents or the elders or, or whatever, because marriage was not about love. It was about forming alliances. And in um, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, there's formal formal systems of gift exchange. So bands will come together, they'll exchange gifts and gift exchange greases the wheels for mate exchange, right? And then mates are exchanged and most hunter gatherers, it's uh, women are the ones that leave the group. That's not always the case, okay? We call that patrilocal. So men stay local, women move out. Now, in other animals where, and this happens with chimps, of course, right? Individuals leave the home group. That's the most dangerous time in their, in their life. They have to go out, they're on their own, could easily be killed by a predator at that point. But when they make contact with another group, oh, you know, there's all kinds of display activity and it's dangerous and sometimes they get killed and so on. Um, the reason that doesn't happen in modern human societies is because we've already made the deal, right? The deal was struck five, 10 years earlier that such an individual was gonna leave. That is the geniusness of reciprocal exogamy and kinship systems and language that sets that up. So uh, in my opinion, Neanderthals had a single level society, in which case individuals left the troop 
and had to make contact and figure out a way to get into that group. Now they did, They're, of course, otherwise the species would be extinct, but it's still a risky moment. It's a dangerous moment and it's clumsy from the standpoint of a modern human. So th thank you for this talk. This was uh, just really interesting. I, I really appreciate this. Um, my question's a little different, less on the, um, the research and the findings and more on you're a really good science communicator yourself. Um, and I, I know that you've also done many interviews with reporters. Um, so I'm just curious how you evolved yourself as a science communicator. You started to get into a little of that with the writing the Scientific American pieces, but what more have you learned? And, and even in giving this presentation to this group, what goes into figuring out how you're gonna communicate what you've done your research on? Right, yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, um, I used to suffer terrible stage fright. And uh, to the point where when I was um, in school, high school, I actually uh, <laughs> twice um, passed out on stage, blacked out uh, in it when I was, you know, doing little things for school, right, chorus and so on. And uh, so I had I had to get past that, and I tackled that um, with you know doing some reading and research. But I, I'll never forget I was driving and listening to NPR and a psychologist who specialized in it. Uh, was talking about it. And she said, you know, there's no tricks. The, the key thing is you got to just keep showing up. And um, so I pushed myself, I pushed myself relentlessly to give talks, to get up and do it. And a turning point for me was I gave a talk once in Minnesota at this thing called the Nobel Conference. And uh, there were 5,000 people in the audience. And when I stood up to the podium, it was like an assault on my psychology. It was like, jumping out of the airplane or, you know, having a car accident. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. And I felt myself kind of getting that stage fright again. And then I managed, I, you know, I did what I normally do. One of the things I was taught was try to think of something funny as you're going up. And, you know, one of those things is think of your audience as naked. You know, that's a, that's a popular one. I mean, maybe you, the folk, you folk haven't faced this, but I faced it terribly. Um, so, I think that that process, um, that process of forcing myself to constantly give talks, I went out of my way to do it, uh, helped. Um, but also I grew up in a, I was the first person in my family uh, to go to university. I grew up with, you know, people who, um, you know, weren't grounded in science. All my friends were that way. Uh, and, um, you know, that teaches you to speak uh, to, the, to the general public in a way that I think if people are, you know, if you grow up in an environment where both your parents have PhDs, which I find is often the case in academia, right? They, there's this kind of, there's a lineage. Um, they just don't, you know, get it. And uh, so I have, I think I have kind of a background in, um, communicating. I love traveling. And one of the, the, the things I love about traveling is, you know, just drinking and eating and talking crap with the locals. Uh, and friends of mine have always said, I can, I seem to be able to do that anywhere. Um, so that's about, you know, finding a connection to people. Uh, and so for me, I think those are the key elements that have made me a a, a decent speaker to the public. But also I, I try to insert, um, I didn't do much of that today because of the time limit, but I try to insert stories to connect to people, stories of drama and so on, uh, like I did in my writing. I have a question that goes back to an earlier slide. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, this is Peter Likes, I'm in Miami. Um, I had a, I guess, a little question about the timing. Um, Is that back to the original first yeah, one, first one slides? Very early slides where you talked about the crossbreeding between uh, our right. ancestors. Yep. 
and uh, you know even even be yeah that that's the slide right um, you actually gave some figures some um, some dates of a sort so when you talk about the Eurasian archaic lineage and the African um, you gave a this is back around 400,000, 500,000 years ago. But, okay, yeah. But humans hadn't, Homo sapiens hadn't really evolved yet by then. So what kind of, uh, what kind of apes are you imagining are doing all this gene flow? Right, so I left off many of the species names back here. Back here. Because... Okay. Um, so you're thinking of things like, uh, like Lucy or... Um, no, so Lucy is way back earlier. Um, oh, okay. This would have been something like Homo heidelbergensis. Yeah, okay. Around so this time. Right, so you think there was a lot of, uh, in those earlier Homo species, there was a lot of crossbreeding, you thought, you think? I think, okay, so up until about 400,000 years ago, I think there was modest gene flow in and out of Africa. But that gene flow got cut when the Sahara Desert formed. And that's really when you start to see a divergence in the lineages uh, that resulted in Neanderthals and Denisovans in Eurasia and modern humans in, in Africa. Right. So even, um, it was interesting, I was just reading a paper uh, yesterday. It was uh, in the annual reviews of genetics um, on uh, an overview of the genetics for modern human origins. And um, as far back as, a lot of this depends on whose date you're going, going on, but um, let's just say that the Khoisan lineage, the Bushman lineage appears at least by 110, 120,000 years ago. And the Khoisan lineage does not have gene flow with a modern human lineage outside the Khoisan lineage until 2000 years ago. They were an isolated breeding population for that long. And 2000 years ago is when we have what's called the Bantu expansion, right? So people with Bantu speaking, Bantu speaking people uh, invent iron technology, you know, sometime between 4,000 and 5,000 years ago. And they spread all over Africa with, with this iron technology. Yeah. And they encounter Khoisan people and interbreed with them. So um, I, and it's just it really had more to do with the, this early, uh, the evidence for this early gene flow that you're talking about. Um, I can't remember all the homo species, but, uh, but right. anyway, um, you know, we don't so, really know very much about them except for fossils. Well, we have, we have genomes from some of these taxa, right? There's genomes from the Atapuerca fossils, um, but also we have, we have the anatomy. And the fact that the anatomy is so similar, that also suggests that gene flow is taking place. So for example, there's a skull from Greece called Petrolona, and it, it looks almost exactly like a, a, a near contemporary skull from Southeast Africa. Mm -hmm. And you, would, you wouldn't have that unless there was connectivity between the okay. populations, okay? Mm -hmm. but, um, but you know, we know, because we have Neanderthal genomes, um, and of course, modern human genomes, quite a bit about the evolutionary history of the relationship between the Neanderthal lineages and us. And there wasn't gene flow between them and us until there's a little bit of gene flow at about 110,000, 100,000. That's probably due to a failed exit of modern humans out of Africa. But it's this one at 70, 60,000. We actually have a thigh bone, a, a femur, of a modern human from Europe that was six to eight generations removed from a hybridization event of a modern human and a Neanderthal. And that can be just de determined from the, the genome. Yeah. So we know quite a bit about those genomes. We'll know, we'll know more as time go on, but yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, Tabitha, do you want to ask your question next? I see your hand is raised. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? I can. Yep. Um, I'm interested in how the fossil record backs up what you have said. I'm making 
I guess primarily in the fossil record in coastal South Africa, but also um, how would your ideas relate to the various um, many homo fossils that have been found uh, in the Rift Valley, for example? In the Rift Valley. Yeah, so yeah. the Rift Valley has contributed uh, several very important early modern human fossils. Um, so there are, there are two from, or three from Ethiopia that date between about 190,000 and 140,000 years ago. And those are reasonably complete crania. And uh, they fall within the range of variation of modern humans, but they're certainly at the far end of that variation. So, you know, if you sat down next to one of those people in a subway, you would look at them and go, okay, that's a little odd. Um, but, uh, but they are, they are within the Homo sapiens range of variation. In South Africa, we have a pretty good fossil record that, in fact, the, the, the best sample we have is from a site called Colossi's River, which is just down the road from Pinnacle Point where, where I, where I work. And, uh, Again, those are modern, you know, they date between 110,000 and 50,000 years ago. Um, but again, they're, they're a little bit robust. They're a little bit on the outside range of modern human variation. And I think a, a lot of that has to do with the fact that right at the boundary between the Pleistocene and the Holocene, which is around 12,000 years ago, there's a fairly major change throughout the old world or, or Eurasia and Africa and human skeletal characteristics and modern humans get um, kind of smaller and more gracile at that time. And uh, there could be lots of reasons why that happened, um, which we don't need to get into. But um, Pleistocene modern humans were uh, bigger and more robust, better, you know, better muscled, stronger muscled than we are. Um, so they're modern, but they are uh, a little bit different. All right, um, we're, uh, I think we originally planned to go to five, so we're a little bit over at this point. Um, I guess we'll take one more question, Does if anybody has one, or Ken, you could ask one of your questions. Not unless I'm unmuted, I can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Um, I'm looking through these things. Or Leah has a question. Oh, go, go with Leah's question. <laughs> Thanks, Jean. Um, I was wondering if, because you discussed the different coastline temperatures and like the amazing kind of situation that South Africa provided climactically and geographically and like with plant life, are there any other areas in the world that kind of replicate those situations like on the coastlines? Uh, yeah, I would, well, not in terms of plant diversity that the Cape Floral region is just ridiculously unique uh, in plants. You're just not gonna find something like that anywhere else. Um, and, but I would say, let's, let's just stick to Africa for a second because that's where modern humans come from. And if someone was to argue, well, where else in Africa could the modern human lineage evolved in a coastal context? The only other place would be um, the Atlantic coast of North Africa. Okay, so Morocco area. And the reason is, is there's a, there's a cold upwelling off the coast of the, the Atlantic coast and Morocco that creates a very rich intertidal zone in that zone. Now, as soon as you go through uh, the Straits of Hercules, right into the Mediterranean, you basically enter a warm bathtub. And the Mediterranean overall has uh, nutrient poor intertidal zones. So the productivity of the intertidal zone right at Gibraltar goes from high to low as you pass in. And then, decreases even further as you head uh, east toward Egypt and Israel. So the intertidal zones there are the, are the least productive. And, you, you and it's because the intertidal animals, right, are for the most part filter feeders or algae feeders 
So you have to have this kind of upwelling condition to get that richness. Now, um, there's been a lot of work in North Africa on the Atlantic coastline research, archeological research over the last 20 years. And my colleagues there have, you know, they've claimed, oh yeah, Curtis, we've got a rich coastline too, right? So maybe modern humans appeared there first. Well, we now have probably 110, 120 uh, radiometric dates on human occupations there. And they don't show an isotope stage six occupation. They don't. So from 130,000 years ago, in my opinion, I mean, if we were at a conference, people might be arguing with me, oh, there's one date from here. And that, in my opinion, one date doesn't mean a thing. You've got to have a sample, right? Um, in my opinion, the research that the 20 to 30 years of research that we've had in North Africa has shown us that North Africa is abandoned <laughs> and the glacial stage six. Sorry, the modern human lineage didn't come from there. If there's no one there, it didn't come from there, right? Now you'd hear screaming from my colleagues if, if I said that at a conference. Uh, and I, I, I have, so I know I, I've heard that screaming. <laughs> all right thank you all so much for joining us um and and curtis for for the wonderful talk um i just have a couple things that i want to mention to close out um about our organization appalachian science communicators um so our next event is a virtual happy hour that we're hosting jointly with our neighbors the dc science writers association which is one of maybe it's the longest running regional NASW group. They've been around for over 30 years um, and they've got this really cool platform. This is not, you know, your run of the mill Zoom, you know, everybody talking at once. Um, it's called Gather Town and you have this little 8-bit avatar. It's like, I don't know, like the original Zelda. It's cool, check it out. Um, that's happening Tuesday, April 13th at six o'clock. Um, you can go to our website for more information and you need to register to get the link. Um, and then also we're excited to share, we don't have a date for this one yet, but we're in talks with two producers from 60 Minutes on CBS about um, being speakers for our next virtual talk in early May. Um, they're experts at taking complex scientific topics and making them approachable to the general public. So this would be um, more uh, in the line of a professional development talk. So um, we'll announce that soon on our website, Twitter and Facebook as the date and time get firmed up. But hope to see you all. And um, thanks again for joining us today. <laughs>